So good morning. My name is Murray, one of the pastors here at Grace Fellowship, and today we are going to talk about submission and suffering. So this message is going to be about as popular as a 4 a.m. car alarm. (laughs) And that's because, really, because we're sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, the original rebels without a cause. And so we value our independent freedom. We love to trash authority. Insubordination is just, just part of the air we breathe. And so it doesn't take much for us to retaliate. I mean, someone cuts me off on Circle Drive, right? I want to retaliate. And so we're angered so easily from janitors to prime ministers. But Peter's going to call us to a different way. He's going to call us to a different power, um, really, than ourselves, to live strangely in this world, in our culture as exiles, even suffering unjustly and not retaliating to reveal Jesus to the world in which we live. And so the Jews, in fact, when Jesus came in his day, they were really uh, looking for a Messiah that would retaliate, that would, um, would really just smite their enemies, right? Smite the nation of Rome, just, just smite them with justice. And what they seemed to forget was that they themselves are sinners, And Jesus broke their messianic mold to pieces when he came in meekness and humility as a servant and self-sacrifice. He was rejected by the world. And that same world, now he puts the church into that world. And yet we seem to like to be in control, to be comfortable, to be self-fulfilled. But what Jesus is going to call us to is something different. And he's going to call us to do good, even suffer Uh, for doing so, if need be, as the way to advance the kingdom of our suffering servant king. And so, if you have difficulty with the content today, please send all your emails to the Apostle Peter. You'll have to Google his address. But he wrote this under the submission, under the inspiration, really, of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm just the messenger. And so we're working through this book. That's one of the reasons we do walk through books of the Bible. We try to go through them verse by verse so that um, it puts us in spots like this. Because otherwise I wouldn't choose to sort of take this topically. But we have to deal with it as it comes up in the text. And so we walk through the scripture so we don't overemphasize things that we might like to overemphasize and preach on our hobby horses. But it also keeps us from underemphasizing things that God has emphasized and put in his word. So this is why we do this. If you need a Bible, there's still a few Bibles left on the little table over here. You can take one of those and follow along. Or if you've got a Bible on your app, you can turn to 1 Peter, then chapter 2. And if you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to just take one of those Bibles and then just take it home with you. It's our gift to you. And you can read this whole little letter that that Peter wrote. So I want to start with, first of all, by backing up in 1 Peter uh, to verse chapter 2, verse 13. And that's where Greg walked us through this passage last time. But I think because it's all connected, we need to review. And so in verse 13, he says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So which ones? Every human institution. That would include then, you got parents, teachers, uh, bosses, government leaders, more. Every human institution. That, that's the general principle. And then what he's going to do is he goes through this, and even into chapter 3, he's going to unpack some, some different specific examples. So he goes on to say whether this is to the emperor as supreme or to governors. And I think what Greg brought up last time is what's significant. Who is the emperor here? Nero. Nero. And so Nero is a deranged man who, who basically, he even poisoned his own mother. He, he killed one of his wives and his cousins just because he felt they might be a threat to his power. He, he thought himself a bit of a musician, and so he would hold little concerts, and, and everybody had to be there, and nobody could leave. So uh, according to one of the historians, some of the women would feign going into labor, or one guy feigned uh, that he was dying, just so they could get out of that. But I mean, he's the guy that would uh, impale Christians in his garden, cover them with pitch, light them on fire, because they claimed to be the light of the world, This is the kind of guy it was. He was not exactly a model of justice, equity, 
and godliness. And so that's why you have to see the phrase in verse 13, for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake, right? We're to live out our gospel identity in all our relationships. We're to live as servants. We are servants, right? Willing really to suffer for doing good because Jesus, that's our king, he came as an exile, he came as a servant, and he entered into, he embraced suffering, though he did nothing wrong. In fact, the only thing he did was truly love and serve people. And so we're called to live a life of sacrificial service. And for this, you're going to need a lot of energy that doesn't just come from your own flesh. You're going to need a lot of endurance. So where are you going to get this endurance? Where are you going to get this empowering to live this way? Well, that's what Peter's going to get to in this passage. Because living too, we're going to see, living as an exile in this world, in this culture, is very complex, and so there's going to be a lot of situations that arise that, you know, that uh, are not just going to have easy, simple, straightforward answers. And Christians, too, we see that in society are often the subject of derision. You know, and how do we put people to silence? Well, by overwhelming them with good, according to verses 15 and 16. We see there that our call is to always do good as servants of God. We are free servants who are just driven by love. And so to live as free servants, that really gives us this wonderful balance because we understand a couple things. We know that there is an authority behind every authority. And so because we know that God's authority is behind every other human authority, we respect and honor human authority more than other people. But on the other hand, we also know that there is an authority over every authority. And so we just don't go along with the crowd and simply go along with everything. In verse 17, he says, honor everyone. Now, I don't tend to see a lot of honoring of people. You know, if you're on the wrong side of my theology, if you're in the wrong end of my political spectrum, right? I see people hate one another in Jesus' name. And there has to be a way for which those of us who've been impacted by this incredible gospel of grace to truly honor people even those with whom you greatly disagree. The world tends to honor people usually for one of two reasons. One is out of fear. So we'll honor them because, hey, we might lose our job. or that. So, so we end up uh, showing respect or honor because of fear of those in authority. The other reason we tend to honor people is to get something in return. And there are places where customer service is unbelievable. I mean, Disney World, cruises, resorts, and I feel honored. I mean, I mean, but I always realize that they're doing what they do because they want my money, right? Honoring me gets them something in return. But as a church, that's not the way we're to honor people. We honor them because they're made in the image of God and because they're precious to him. And so if an unwed mother with three kids pulls up here to the theater, we want our greeting team to rush out and help her and to do that, not because she might give a big check in the offering, but because she's made in the image of God, she's precious to him, and we just want to serve her in love for the Lord's sake. And so we honor people for Jesus' sake, right? So not because of what they can do for us, but because of what Jesus has done for us. That's going to be the heart of really what Peter's been, been getting at. And so then he says, love the brotherhood. That's a special love for the church because we're family. Fear God. In other words, don't fear the emperor. So don't have fear be your motive for why you honor people. But, and then he says, honor the emperor. Now, for some of you, the dishonor that you show Justin Trudeau is sinful. We may as well call it what it is. And that goes for some of you with the dishonor that you regarded and maybe still show Stephen Harper. Honor those in authority. Now, you can strongly disagree. Your heart can be broken. You can even disobey. But do so with honor for God-ordained authorities praying for their souls. I think that should be part of what that looks like. Now, remember, this submission to authority is given to us through Peter, right? A guy who used to swing his sword first, ask questions later. And so, but then after the resurrection of Jesus, when Peter now has to take a stand, we see this throughout the book of Acts, 
he suddenly manifests this strong and gentle difference. Like he saw in Jesus, who suffered in self-sacrificing love, submitting himself to the Roman authorities for the salvation of many. Even some of those same very Roman authorities, as uh, Greg showed us last week, that, that uh, centurion. So let's have our scripture video where we now pick it up at verse 18 through to the end of the chapter. And so, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. Reading from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, One endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It says, We submit our servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So we submit then, as we said, not because of the earthly master's authority, but because of our ultimate master's authority. And so that word in verse 18, where it says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. With all respect is literally the word fear. All fear. It's the same word that's actually Peter used just before it in verse 17. If you just glance up to verse 17, where he calls them to fear God. And so I think what he's getting at here, this with all respect, with all fear, is with that fear of God. Our motivation really is our fear, our respect of God. As verse 19, he goes on to say, right, being mindful of God. We see also in verse 20, right, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So we begin to see that it's for God that we ultimately do what we do. And so even then being insubordinate, if that's what it takes to be, to do good, and even if we have to suffer for it, which is what verse 20 gets at. Now, this can get very complex, lots of different situations, but too often I think we're really quick to go to the exceptions. You know, we, we want to just go to the theory, we want to go to the exceptions, we want to debate it. And so I think, though, that we can draw out a couple principles that Peter has really been pushing down. He's going to continue to do that throughout his letter um, that I think just ring generally true that before we get on to the, the debates and the theories and the what-ifs and what if this situation is, that I think we should make sure, let's get the core first. And I think we see from Peter's writing, we're called to move into relationships to serve. And most people move into relationships to be served. You go into a room, you size it up. Is this going to be good use of my time, right? Are these the kind of people I want to be with, right? Am I going to get anything out of this? And if we don't feel we're going to get enough out of it, we're out of there. Maybe we don't even go in the first place, right? So most people just don't live with this attitude, I'm here to serve. How exactly can I be of benefit, be useful to these people? And we see some things with people with a servant heart. First of all, they're affirming, right? They, they honor you. They actually, they make you feel honored. They focus on you they listen well. And then secondly, we see that the servant heart who honors others, they overlook slights and faults. So they're not overly critical because they're all about what you need, not what bothers them. And thirdly, they don't serve to be noticed or even to feel needed, right? Where they get their sense of worth actually by serving. 
And fourthly, you'll see they don't seek position. They're not out there to get their, their name out there. They're not there to get a title. The Bible says this. It says, I want you to live lives of selfless service. I want you to submit to authority. I want you to go the extra mile. I want you to turn the other cheek. I want you to forgive those who have spitefully used you. I want you to serve people, even unhappy people, even stubborn people, even people that are really kind of unlovely and difficult to love. I want you to serve them unselfishly. Right? And he says, because this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Verse 20. He says that again. That uses that phrase in verse 19 as well. This is a gracious thing. So what does that mean? This is a gracious thing. Well, to get some help, sometimes when I can't figure out what something is going to mean, and rather than just read my own perspective or experience into it, I try to look and see, well, where else does Scripture use this term? And that sometimes can be helpful, comparing Scripture with Scripture. So I found this term used several times in Luke chapter 6, verse 32 to 36, where Jesus is talking. Of course, that's where Peter gets most of his ideas. And in verse 32 of Luke 6, Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what benefit? See that word benefit? That's the same word that's translated gracious thing in 1 Peter. Let's see if this will help us pick up what Peter is getting at. So if you love those who love you, what benefit, what gracious thing is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit, guess what word that is? Same word. What benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit, different word in English, but guess what? Same word again. What benefit? What benefit? What credit? What credit is to you? What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount right? That's what motivates them in what they do. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, for your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. You'll reflect really the image of who God is because he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. So thus, we see that a, a tenets of that gracious thing is finding favor in God. There's a, there's a reward to be had, right? God is saying, there's a reward coming your way. Don't worry, you won't, you're not doing this for nothing. And 1 Peter 3.9, he's going to go on to bring home that same principle, talking about you're going to receive a blessing when you bless those who curse you. Not necessarily from them, but God says, don't worry, I'm looking after things. And so we, we see this. So it's a gracious thing in the sight of God. So your suffering for doing good is a beautiful thing in God's eyes. It just, it just oozes out grace that God loves to do. And you'll be rewarded graciously and lavishly, he says. And so we do this, being mindful of God. And it will be more than made up for, he says, one day. So as situations arise, you need to consider at different times what you can change, what you can't alter. I don't believe that this passage forbids uh, appealing to proper authorities for using the proper channels given to us that Jesus says to, to use in his word. And so, but we do see this in verse 21. He says, for to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So for to this, in other words, this suffering unjustly, this, this uh, doing good, this, this returning blessing for evil, it's to this, because that's what Jesus did, right? Jesus did this, leaving you an example, it says, verse 21. But if you start there, if you start with... Man, because Jesus is our example. So that's what we need to do. Okay, I'm going to do what he did. I'm going to live as he lived, right? Got my WWJD bracelet on, let's go. I mean, but if you start there, if you just start saying, okay, he's my example, so I got to do this, you're going to get really discouraged. Because just look at his teaching. What does Jesus say? He says, you've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, 
You shall not even have a malicious thought. You shouldn't even have um, a hateful or spiteful word. You should always be filled with compassion and servanthood. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not steal. But I say to you, you shouldn't even be discontent. You shouldn't even be envious. You should always be grateful and, and peaceful in your heart. You've heard it said, no adultery. I say to you, don't even lust. And you got to remember, Jesus lived out everything he taught. Right? He didn't teach one thing and do another. He lived that out. Just look at his actions. You just see consistent, unbelievable love of his father, trust of his father. You see this consistent love of others. He committed no sin, we're told in verse 22. Right? There was, there was never any deceit coming out of him because his heart was filled with genuine love. It was all genuine. So if you've ever really looked at the example of Jesus, it knocks you down to the dirt. It just knocks you to the dirt. I mean, Jesus was perfectly wise. He never said a wrong word. Never an inappropriate statement ever came out of his mouth. Oh, I wish. So Jesus, as an example, just knocks you right down to the ground like Job, who says, yeah, I knew about you in a general kind of way, but now I see you with my eyes, and I despise myself. I abhor myself or repent in dust and ashes. And so if Jesus, and you start with Jesus just as your example, then he is nothing more than a prosecutor pointing at your life, just revealing how far short you come. But that's not the gospel. And that's not with this passage where it starts. The gospel is before he's your example. Notice what it says before he talks about being the example. What's it say in verse 21? It doesn't just say, because Christ suffered to be your example. What does it say? Pardon? Pardon? Yeah, you're called to this. But what's verse 21 say? Continue. He suffered for you. Does it not say that first? Then it says that ends up leaving you an example. If you miss over that and you just jump to, he left me as an example, I got to get at it. Wow, that's, that's not going to be the place to be. You have to start where Peter does, before he's your example, it's because Christ also suffered for you. That's where it starts. That's the starting point. That's substitution in your place. And that's why Peter, he started his whole letter, right? Emphasizing Jesus saving us, calling us out of darkness, giving this new identity. And otherwise, you have religion. I mean, why follow his example? Right? So it's not, we learn not to earn his favor, but it's because I have his gracious favor. He died for me. Right? He died for you. I'm fully accepted, loved in grace. See, I'm a no good, rotten candidate for heaven. And there's no possibility of an entrance to heaven for me, but for Jesus. For everything I deserve, went on him. Why would he do that? Because he loves me, and that stirs me to love him and extend grace to others. You have to start not with just an example. You have to start with Jesus dying in our place. And he died to deliver me from self-absorption, where I don't care about you and your problems. After what Jesus did for me, when I get that, when I'm believing that, it frees me from me. And I begin to care about you who are in the same situation so I can return now good for evil like Jesus did for me. And that you might come to know him as well and glorify God in the day of visitation, as Peter had said earlier. So we are ambassadors of Jesus to suffer for doing good, for doing the right thing. And that's what's imaging forth our Lord and Savior who suffered at the hands of sinful men, though he never did anything wrong. 
So consider Jesus, right? They're pressing the thorns into his brow, right? They're, they're beating him, spitting on him, mocking him, saying all manner of untrue things about him. They assaulted and abused him. And Jesus had all authority. And he endured it. Even praying for them, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I wouldn't have. I would have retaliated. And I would have felt perfectly just, right, to do so. But this is what Jesus did. He endured unjust suffering. And this passage mentions two things, he goes on now to say, that sustained Jesus. And that's what I think we can learn from as well. The first thing we see, he had faith in God's ultimate judgment. Verse 23, when he, Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten what gave him that strength. Why? But continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. See that term, continuing, to, to tr- continuing entrusting himself? Because he did that every moment of every day, in every situation. So here was just one more opportunity to continue to entrust himself to him who judges righteously. So if you've been abused, been mistreated, what does a free servant do? Because everything in us, every moral fiber in us just cries out, this should not be, this is not right. Something should be done here. And if you don't realize this truth, what Jesus is saying here, what Peter is saying, what Jesus did, then you'll seek to avenge yourself. And whether it be an action or gossip or on Facebook or wherever, you retaliate in ways not mindful of our king. Right? We start swinging the sword of our tongue. So we first realize we are not the judge. Because we don't know what that person really deserves. Right? Only God knows what that person really deserves. Only God knows everything that person's been through. He's the only one who knows all the details. So a Christian remembers that and remembers that if Jesus did not avenge his abusers, but actually entrusted himself to God, who judges justly, then surely we have to. And so we can, when we realize, look at what I've done against him and he's forgiven me. Surely I can forgive them. And Peter, we see in other New Testament writers, like places like Romans chapter 12, they emphasize this again and again, telling believers not to to seek vengeance, right? But to leave room, and I think that's kind of leave room in your worldview, your perspective of things, for the wrath of God. God is a God of justice. That's what hell is. It's the, the ultimate righting of all wrongs. It's ultimate justice, People's sins will be paid back. They will face ultimate justice in one of two places. I mean, either in hell or on the cross. Either Jesus paid it or you will. There's no ultimate injustice in the world. There's lots of temporary injustice, but there's no ultimate injustice. So I don't have to take that responsibility on myself. That's what Jesus did. He entrusted himself to God. Now, the only way some people are going to escape the the bitterness and the insane urge to get people back is to learn to rest in the fact of the ultimate justice of God. And the second thing we see in Jesus that is going to empower is just God's love for us, his grace. He suffered in our place. He endured it that we might be delivered and brought back into relationship with it. So always Peter just never strays far from the gospel. That's the motive of following his example, right? And so he's always get there. Verse 24 says, he himself, I love that one, that emphasis. It's he himself. This is what he has done. Bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Something has has to happen in you for you to become faithful servants. And that is, you have to be affected by what Jesus did. And what did he do for you? It says, he himself, God himself, the one, the, the authority we really opposed. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, right? And it's by his wounds 
you've been healed. So it's the freedom that comes from that that enables you to be a servant. Has that happened to you? So one of the things that's so hard about being a good servant of Jesus is that you always have to keep afresh in your heart and mind what he has done, how he has served you. You have to keep it fresh, right? If it just stays intellectual, you know, kind of remote, um, you kind of know it, but it's not affecting you, then it's very hard to love unlovely people. And that's one of the reasons we try to break bread and, and have Lord's table every week so that we would meet there in the presence of God and that the gospel message of what he did, bearing our sins in his own body tree, would affect us, would affect us, and not just stay then on that intellectual, academic level. And Jesus died voluntarily. In fact, Jesus is the only one who ever voluntarily died. Well, you can say that's not true. Yeah, you got it. But you first thought, well, that's not true, because I know there's some people who have who've voluntarily died for great causes. No, they might have chosen the moment or the means by which they died, but they didn't choose the fact of their death, because they already had to die. Jesus is the only person who never had to, but he chose to. And here's my question, what what kept Jesus there under that abuse, under that unjust suffering? The nails, the chains. He's the creator of the universe. Any second, he could have stopped it. At any moment, right? He could have just left. What kept him there? What kept him bound to that cross in unbelievable pain and suffering? It must have been his love for you. Nothing else, because there's nothing else strong enough in this universe to keep him there. And you know what it's like when you're in, in pain, right? When you're in pain, it's, it's, it's hard to keep that self-control, right? I mean, I want to punch my dentist sometimes. And I, and I went there on purpose. And he's helping me, and I know it. But when that pain starts going in there, and he gets that little drill going, I want to react, because it's tough to endure in pain, and Jesus said in John 10, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus knew his job was to suffer and to die. And he left it to his father to judge. And our call is to endure suffering, leaving it in our father's hands to judge so that many can come to know his saving love. Because when you look at the cross and you see what Jesus did for you, I mean, he stuck with you when it was hard and when the pain was real and intense. And a big part of what it means to be a Christian is there are going to be periods of time, there's going to be situations that arise to which if you obey Jesus, it's going to be really impractical and it doesn't feel very good. So how do you get through those times? Right? It doesn't seem to be fun. It's very impractical. Well, you look at Jesus who stuck with you through a time that wasn't very satisfying for him. And you say, if you could put up with that for me, I'm going to put up with this for you. Peter says, we were the rebels who had resisted authority, the servants who rebelled against our rightful master, the unjust ones who rejected the rightful rule of God. Jesus was the Lord who submitted to death, the master who became a servant the rightful ruler who suffered under our injustice. But by submitting to our injustice, he redeemed us. So now we should do likewise. So we take this posture towards others so that more can also be redeemed. Do we have any questions? Just one. Just one. I'm surprised. Only one. How is it possible to go against someone's commands, rules, and still honor them? Just read through the end of the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, any of those gospel accounts, and read Jesus 
and look at him and see what he says, where he goes with, where he is submissive and honors, and where he still stands for what's true. Read through the book of Acts and look at the life of Peter, who's the one who wrote this letter. And as we see him come and honor those who, who, who basically beat them and then forbid them to talk about Jesus anymore, and Peter just honorably says to them, respectfully as the authorities, and says, you have authority, you know, to, to do what you say, but whether it's right, let's see, to listen to God or to you, you decide, you tell me. But we cannot stop preaching in this man's name, the one in whom you see this man healed. And you're going to see him continue to they have a respect and an honor that's a God-given place. It's great to have authority. That's a good thing. Take music. We've got music here. And that was a great to be able to worship God in that. But you know what? They had to submit to authority to have the freedom for us to even do this, to experience this together. Because they had to submit to the authority of the writer of the music. And they submitted to follow his notes, that timing, that key. They had to submit to an authority to have the, the music actually play out for us. So that's a good thing. But if someone wants to use something or causing us to disobey the ultimate authority who's over them, they're supposed to steward their authority for him, then we obey. We have great respect that there is authority. We don't want anarchy. But, but we have to follow our greater king, first of all. In other words, we're going to do good even if we suffer for it. We're going to strive to do the right thing even if it costs us our job. We're going to do what's right even if we suffer for it. So that's the, the call. So just look at the examples of in Acts and Jesus himself. And there you see that reflection of what it looks like to honor authority, be glad for authority, that there is that order in our society. At the same time, we still have to always do what's right. So Peter closes this section by saying, by his wounds, you've been healed. In verse 25, he says, for you... This reminds us who we were, where we were at, where he found us. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Who put those wounds there? We did. I did. Those wounds were the unjust wounds we inflicted on him by our sin. And Jesus didn't make us pay it back. He didn't speak one word against us. Instead, he opened up his arms and welcomed me in as a child. Not just a forgiven sinner, but raised up as sons and daughters. He suffered unto death for our salvation. And his wounds healed us. He's quoting from Isaiah 53 here. Right? And how does he understand this healing? How does Peter understand this, this, this healing? Well, he healed us, first of all, by bearing our sins. Right? We were straying, it says, but now have returned. It's really interesting that the tense in verse 25, it's, it's literally, it says, we have been returned. It's the exact same verb tense used in verse 21. Notice in verse 20, it says, you have been called. Verse 24, same tense, you have been healed. And now verse 25, it actually literally is the same tense. You have been brought back. You have been returned. Someone brought you back. Someone returned you. So at the heart of this healing is what? Is fellowship with Jesus. The shepherd and overseer of our souls. Jesus brought us home. How does God use you now to bring back other straying ones? Sometimes by the way you suffer. Responding as Jesus did to you. You show you have faith in God's justice that's greater than this world. Show you have a joy that's imperishable, but can't be touched by the threats of this world and a selfless love for others that's just beyond the reach of this world. So amaze them by how you suffer to the point that he's going to go on in chapter 3, says they ask you about it. They ask you, 
for a reason for this hope that lies within you. And so we live in a world of real evil. And when you show you've got a hope that goes beyond their hope, that you have a joy that pain cannot take away and a peace that passes all understanding, that, that is God's attention getter that I think may be just a great need in our cynical post-Christian age. It might be our most powerful witness, more than all the apologetics and everything else you can come up with. So let's pray for a work of the Spirit to enable us to die to self, to live as free servants, so that we might do good, reflecting the humble grace of Jesus, even if we have to suffer for doing the right thing. And let's expect some amazing evangelistic results. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wow. Lord, I know in my flesh where I naturally go to. I know how I naturally respond to pain. I know how I naturally respond to being treated unjustly. I know how quickly I go there. So Lord, we need a filling of your spirit. We need you to do a work so that the life of Jesus, Holy Spirit, can provide the empowering for us to live supernaturally, to live beyond what I would naturally just do in my flesh. And Lord, that we might just together as a community be able to manifest the glory of Jesus who's shown us such grace that we can then extend grace to others. And our heart desire is that you might use it, that, the, that our suffering, our serving would not be wasted, but Lord, that you might use it to bring in lost people. They could be brought home. They could be returned by you, Jesus, um, even as you've done for us return to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we just are so grateful and so kind. So Lord, I just pray that there's something in this truth will just continue to percolate in our hearts and minds and will cause us to reflect as we live uh, day by day as your ambassadors, exiles in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.